Well, good evening, everybody. You still awake out there? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're really going to switch gears. We're going in a radically different direction now, and we're going to talk about BDSM, pornography, and really horrible stuff. Uh, just what you want before you go to bed. <laughs> Not. Um, but we have to say, uh, we're going to be talking about the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon, and we could probably do a two-day seminar um, on all the things that are wrong about this phenomenon in this series, but we're either crazy enough or just amazing enough to try it in 15 minutes. So, here we go. Thank you. Um, badly written fiction with thin plots and unbelievable characters are published every day. Fifty Shades of Grey is one such book. So what's the big deal? Well, most bad books get bad reviews and die of oblivion. Um, just, uh, you know, nobody reads them, right? But unfortunately, that is not the case of Fifty Shades of Grey. Before I go any further, has anybody in the room not heard of Fifty Shades of Grey? Probably some of our foreign guests, so you've not heard of it at all. Okay. Has anybody heard of it but doesn't know the premise? Okay. We cannot afford the luxury of ignoring this bad book because its unprecedented popularity has it exerting enormous influence on mainstream culture, leading some commentators to say things like, some couples are treating it like a how-to manual, as well as capturing the imagination of Christ followers who find that it is enticing, engaging, and intense, that, it, that, that its depictions of sex that are enticing, engaging, and intense, are spicing up their marriages. So ideas do indeed have consequences. Okay. So a little bit about the books for those of you who haven't heard much about them. So there's a, they're actually a trilogy, uh, the first of which is called Fifty Shades of Grey, and we'll be using that sort of as an overarching um, book for discussing all three of them. Um, Fifty Shades Darker is the second in the series, and then Fifty Shades Three, or excuse me, Freed. <laughs> um, now, these began as what is called fan fiction. So, this, the author of the book, of the books, E.L. James, was a fan of the series Twilight. Um, again, that's another really popular series. Some of you may have seen the movies, uh, but it's about this young girl who falls in love with a vampire and all this ensuing drama. Okay, so there's, there's a, a slight theme of some of the Twilight themes that you, you can follow some of the threads in um, the Fifty Shades series as well. Um, now, but the, the real difference here is that with Fifty Shades, you, get, you, you dive head first, headlong, into the abyss of BDSM. And what we're talking about there is bondage, discipline, domination, submission, sadism, uh, sadomasochism. Now, you might think, well, why should we care? Why does this matter? Well, first of all, in about a year and a half um, since this, these books have um, emerged, uh, 70 million copies have been sold. And it's just breaking all kinds of records. And it's the highest selling book, I think, maybe ever now in the UK. It's being translated into more than 30 languages. It's sparked an absolute skyrocketing sales in sexual paraphernalia. It has, it's got, there's a movie, a Hollywood produced movie that will be coming out sometime next year that will attempt to portray um, this story on film. And then <laughs> my personal view is that I think we're witnessing a phenomenon that is, is every bit as significant as the launch of Playboy in 1950. What Playboy did with the normalization of pornography within the male population and just normalizing it within American society, we see happening now with for women and pornography, but not just pornography, a very bent and warped perspective of pornography that features BDSM. Okay, so I'll just look very briefly at the characters or two main characters. Um, Anna is a college senior, so um, she's young. She studies English literature. She works at a hardware store, so she struggles financially. Um, she's a virgin, and not only just a physical virgin, but has like no love, no, has never really had a romance in her life, so extremely inexperienced. Um, her biological father is dead. Her mother's had multiple marriages, and she's an only child. Uh, 
Uh, Christian Gray, on the other hand, is a billionaire business executive. He's young and gaspingly handsome. It's a word that's used a lot in this book. He plays the piano, he speaks French, he flies his own helicopter, he enjoys hang gliding, he has a rooftop apartment with a view over Seattle. Um, he was adopted as a young boy. He has a dark past. His, he was born to a prostituted person, and at the age of four, he was adopted by a family. And as a teenager, he was sexually abused by his adoptive mother's friend who trained him uh, in this BDSM sexual practice. All right, so that's a little bit about the characters, now a little bit about the plot. So Anna, of course, Anna and Christian, they meet. There's some immediate chemistry and sparks. And then, um, but Kristen, or excuse me, Christian, being the billionaire that he is, uh, begins to pursue Anastasia with lavish gifts and basically begins a grooming process by giving her lots of expensive gifts. Um, but then very quickly in the relationship, it's revealed that Christian pursues BDSM sexual practices, that it inc which include bondage and handcuffs and whips and every you know just really wild stuff. Um, and he wants to have Anna sign a contract to enter into a BDSM relationship with him for a period of three months, in which he will have ultimate and total control of her um, sexually. So she will be his submissive in the relationship. Um, but it, interestingly, she's also not permitted to discuss his proposal with anyone, not her family, not her friends. So um, this you know, young, innocent, virginal girl uh, is confronted with this moral dilemma in which she's not allowed to counsel with anyone. Um, so again, he's you know, monopolizing and slight, you know, pressuring for control. And ultimately, again, pretty quickly, they begin having sex, and the sex scenes are de that are depicted are exceedingly um, explicit, um, mind-blowingly explicit, and um, edge envelope pushing, and they have multiple unrealistic orgasms, and um, Anna basically ends up falling for Christian. Um, but it's really struggling with this moral dilemma, the, the emotional pull of, of, this, uh, of this relationship. She has this sort of good angel, bad angel voice going back and forth in her head, um, really, that she's really conflicted about should she go forward, pursue the relationship. So again, why do we care that this book has taken so many women by storm? Um, because for the most part, it tells terrible lies, damaging lies. The first lie, is um, about how we were created as men and women to live in relation to each other. It depicts um, a clear relationship of idolatry. So from the author's dedication on the opening page, which is to her husband, where she says, for Niall, the master of my universe, um, to the final page, we are served up a master-slave scenario that puts a human in the place of God. And yet this book is being treated as a sex and romance manual by millions of women. Um, Rollo May speaks to the error of looking uh, to sex for salvation in this quote. The books which roll off the presses on technique and love and sex have a hollow ring. For most people seem to be aware that the frantic quality with which we pursue technique as our way to salvation is in direct proportion to the degree which, which we have with, sorry, to the degree to which we have lost sight of the salvation we are seeking. It is an old and ironic habit of human beings to run faster when we have lost our way. And we grasp more fiercely at research, statistics, and technical aids in sex when we have lost our values and meaning of love. All right, so what does a relationship look like with Christian Grey? What is, how is this characterized? Well, in the contract that he lays out, here's what he says. He says, the dominant accepts the submissive as his to own, control, dominate, and discipline during the term, so the, the term of the contract, okay? The dominant may use the submissive's body at any time during the allotted times or at any agreed additional times in any manner he deems fit, sexually or otherwise. Additionally, the submissive will obey any instructions given by the dominant immediately without hesitation or reservation and in an expeditious manner. He says, point blank, I want to hurt you. He says, I don't make love, I F hard. He also controls her diet, her exercise regime, 
What she her wears. Her friendships, her clothing. What she wears. Um, and this is popular with women, this book. Christian demands total obedience and submission from Anna. But not even God, who has a right to demand this kind of obedience, um, demands this kind of submission or blind obedience. God doesn't dominate. He invites. Jesus says, follow me. I no longer call you servants, he says. Instead, I call you friends. God doesn't ask for or take pleasure in pointless pain. He wants our true selves. He wants submission for the sake of our freedom, did you lose the slide? If sexual union is a picture, can you get the slide back? If sexual union is a picture of Christ and his church, our lovemaking is a reflection of that relationship. If we are made in the image of God, everything we do, says philosopher Jonathan Fincher, including our lovemaking, should tell the world the truth about what God is like. Well, we're just going to take a little contrast look here at what Fifty Shades of Grey says about uh, relationships and, and power and, and discipline versus what God says. So according to Christian Grey, he enjoys punishment. He enjoys the discipline, but it's all about achieving his own sexual pleasure. But in Scripture, when God disciplines, it's for totally different purposes. He doesn't do it just because he just likes to hurt us or likes to see us suffer or anything like that. As Hebrews tells us, God says, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he loves as a son. But God disciplines our, uh, for our good that we may share in his holiness. Um, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So they couldn't be two more polar opposites for uh, discipline. Both pain and domination are a result of the fall. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Before the fall, neither exists. And after Christ's return, neither exists. After her disobedience in the garden, God said to the woman, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That's the fall. After Jesus comes back, we read in Revelation that he wipes every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So domination and pain pass away in the new Jerusalem. Amen? Okay. Why would we elevate to desirability a physical experience and an unequal relationship, relational dynamic that are the results of sin? All right, now, another lie that this book tells us, um, or that this book perpetrates, is about what women want and about how male-female relationships really work. So, um, in Scripture, we know that Satan offered Eve a choice um, the, of knowing the difference between good and evil. And she ate the fruit, and then she ends up enslaved. Um, Christian also offers a choice. He offers Anna a choice and actually consent is a very big theme that on which this whole book hinges because the idea is as long as you choose it, it must be good if that's something that you, you so yourself will. Um, but again, this, this the result is enslavement because she becomes addicted to him. She can't escape the power of the relationship. She attempts to leave, but she ends up going back. So um, the stage of gray fantasy is dangerous precisely because Anna consents to the treatment she receives. We know that when, when, when one in four American women is sexually assaulted at college, we have to seriously consider the relationship between the kind of dominance, uh, domination, violent fantasy portrayed in this book, which is targeted at women, and which is also exists in so much of the pornography um, that's marketed to men in the world, uh, in mainstream pornography today. So. And the, what we have here is Anna has agreed to Christian Gray's rules in part because she believes she will eventually be able to reach into his dark heart and change him. Ladies, you heard that one before? Yeah. yeah. Know something about that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But real women in real relationships and in abusive relationships know that what a lie it is that she can heal her abuser. The lie only serves to protect the abuser and to keep the victimized stuck in bad situations. Okay. Now 
always mess up here. Okay, now, and when you, when you look at the, the overarching message of that what pornography has been sending from the very beginning, this is even more dangerous because what this pornography says, well, as An Andrea Dworkin has told us so poignantly, she says, the message, the one message that is carried in all pornography all the time is this, that she wants it. She wants to be beaten. She wants to be forced. She wants to be raped. She wants to be brutalized. She wants to be hurt. This is the premise, the first principle of all pornography. And it is certainly the premise of Fifty Shades of Grey. So if 70 million copies and, and growing um, have been sold of this in this of this book and there are fan groups and women show up wherever this author goes to sign books clearly this book is meeting a need in women some need women are hungry for something that this book offers what is it intense sexual experience to be the center of a man's attention to be swept off her feet by a wealthy patron imagine all your chores and financial responsibilities and worries whisked away overnight does the church have anything better to offer today's woman than capitulation to a pornified culture and a complementarian view of gender relations cast in a master-slave mold? Or have we so conformed to the world that we don't have anything to counter this with? Um, Kevin DeYoung wrote, uh, if we could transport Christians from almost any other century to any of today's Christian countries in the West, I believe what would surprise them most, besides our phenomenal affluence, is how at home Christians are with sexual immorality, uh, sorry, impurity. It doesn't shock us, it doesn't upset us, it doesn't offend us or our consciences. In fact, unless it's really bad, and I really would have to ask what really, really bad is, uh, sexual impurity seems normal, just a way of life, and often downright entertaining. Now, lest we seem to be coming down just too hard on Fifty Shades of Grey, we want to make a really clear point here <laughs> um, that none of us should feel safe because our expressions of lust are culturally acceptable or, quote, civilized, all right? As, jo as uh, Joshua Harris says, all lust is bad, okay? So we're not trying to heap condemnation on people who are finding some sort of gratification out of this, but just we, we want to be clear, all lust is bad but that a lot of this is springing forth out of, it's, it's seeds of lust that, are, that this uh, book is germinating. Additionally, we want to hit on the point that lust always starts with something good, um, like a mirror uh, at a carnival, but it takes God's design and then it distorts it. So that is exactly what we see with Fifty Shades of Grey, is taking God's good design and twisting it and distorting it to utter perversion. And a, another really important point here is because there's so strong a theme of sexual exploration and you will find fulfillment and this will be good and you will, um, you know, just go down this path and, and you can reignite your marriage and, uh, you know, the world will be fireworks all the time. But there's a, it's, there's a big danger in this. Again, as Joshua Harris has pointed out, he says, sadly, what many couples discover is that lust doesn't stop prodding them after they've gone all the way. So in this case, he's referring to, you know, of course, uh, sexual consummation before, before marriage. <clears throat> However, it applies in this instance just as well. So he goes on and he says, there's no such thing as all the way with lust. Okay? Because ultimately, lust doesn't want sex. It wants the forbidden. Um, and it's willing to take you deeper and deeper into perversion if you don't indulge its, its, its latest request. So we have to be careful how we fantasize. Sexual, uh, Catholic writers Herder and Hegel write, sexual fantasy is a rehearsal for relationships. If you imagine others as mere instruments of your gratification, you are literally rehearsing exploitative uh, patterns of behavior towards others. The more you picture yourself either using others or being used, the more such encounters will feel familiar and normal. Julia Strunk says, we owe it to both men and women to be more honest about sexuality, desire, the, fall, the nature of the fall, and the blessing of God's redemptive power. Christians should be leading the way on this discussion, not shying away from it, which is why we're up here today. 
But how do we talk about it? How do we talk about it without judging or alienating it other, uh, uh, alienating others? Women in your church have read this book. Maybe you've read it. I've read it. Um, what are they making? What? What are they making of it? Um, Shannon Etheridge suggests that we ask questions, open-ended questions, questions that really want to know. Things like, what went into your decision to read the books? Why do you think these books have become so popular? Um, what kind of effect do you think the books might have on younger women? So just engaging in real, genuine, winsome conversation rather than judging. So lastly, I just want to look at um, Paul's um, letter to, to Timothy, the second letter, where he says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, abusive, unholy, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. It's a perfect description of Christian Gray. But they will not get very far because their folly will be clear to everyone. So our question to you this evening is, will you join with us in making the folly of Shades of Grey worldview clear to everyone? Can we work together to instead offer women and men God's plan for freedom, mutuality, and joy? Thank you.